thank you for downloading this episode of our podcast. Hi, and welcome to the podcast for Solomon Staircase Masonic Lodge number 357, where we talk about all things related with Freemasonry, including hermetic teachings, philosophy, reason, spirituality, and much more. We're located in Buena Park, Southern California. Tune in as we continue to update our podcast with informative talks and articles for Masons worldwide and those who would like to inquire within. The following article is from the July-August 2004 Scottish Rite Journal of Freemasonry. Dialogue between Ernst and Falk by Most Worshipful John L. Cooper III. Lessing addresses Masonic relief in the 18th century. Masonic relief for the less fortunate as an organized activity is often considered a modern phenomenon. Many people think of Masonic charities, such as the Shriners Hospital or the Right Care Childhood Language Program of the Scottish Rite, as purely modern inventions within Freemasonry, something newly created in the 20th century to reach out to non-Masonic world through organized charity. It may come as a surprise to learn that Masonic outreach is more than two centuries old, and a commentary on its function within Freemasonry is found in a powerful Masonic work published in Germany in 1778. Gotthold Ephraim Lessing was a contemporary of other distinguished Freemasons, such as George Washington and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. As a representative of the German Enlightenment, he was almost without equal. In 1778, he wrote Ernst and Falk, a dialogue patterned after Plato's dialogues. Falk is a Freemason, and when the dialogue opens, he is engaged in a conversation with his friend Ernst. Ernst says to Falk, Are you a Freemason? Falk responds, I believe myself to be one. Falk agrees that he was initiated a Mason in a Masonic Lodge, but insists that this is not the real reason why he claims to be a Mason. Falk says, I believe myself to be a Freemason, not so much for the reason that I was initiated by older Masons in a warranted lodge, but because I understand and perceive what Freemasonry is and why it is. Ernst is intrigued by what Freemasonry means to Falk, and Falk is glad to explain it. One part of the dialogue is especially intriguing as it relates to Masonic relief. Falk, when challenged by Ernst to recount the things that Freemasons do for others, as opposed to themselves, is treated to a litany of Masonic philanthropies of the day. A foundling hospital in Stockholm, a workhorse for poor young girls in Dresden, a school for poor boys in Brunswick, and a free public school in Berlin. Falk is modest, but Ernst presses him to admit that Freemasons do all this for the publicity they receive. Falk vehemently denies this, saying the real deeds of the Freemason are so great, look so far ahead, that whole centuries could pass by before one was able to say, that have they done. Ernst closes this part of the conversation with a riddle. Good deeds aim at making good deeds superfluous. Think carefully about the meaning of this riddle as you read about Masonic relief. Lessing is saying that good deeds are not just done to relieve a temporary distress, but rather to set in motion things that will ultimately make those deeds superfluous. In Lessing's day, there were no hospitals for the poor, but Freemasons started them, and soon society came to accept responsibility for medical care for the poor. In Lessing's day, there were no widespread public schools, but Freemasons created them, and soon society came to accept its responsibility for free public education. Masonry believes in equality of men before God, and in 1776, a new political society, America, took its place among the nations of the earth based on Masonic principles. Freemasons founded the Shriners Hospitals when children suffered from infantile paralysis. When that dreaded disease had been conquered, they turned to helping children with other needs. Freemasonry is thus much more than a relief society dedicated to doing good works. It is an idea and an ideal a force for good that changes the world for the better, and it has been doing so for over 300 years. Now I'm going to continue on because in that same section of the uh, journal, there's another article that ties in with our focus on charity this time around. Radford University's Scottish Rite Fellows at Work in Peru. As part of an Operation SMILE medical mission, Professor Michael Van Lu, Communication Sciences and Disorders, Radford University, Radford, Virginia, traveled to Trujillo, Peru with graduate students Janine Hawk, Prue Knight, and Mandy Loria to develop educational materials for parents or caregivers of children with cleft lip and palate. The graduate students, who are Scottish Rite Fellows at RU, analyzed speech patterns to determine which patients could benefit from surgery. 
Prue Knight says this experience reinforced her dedication to the field of speech-language pathology. I realized what an impact I can have as a speech-language pathologist. To help people who really need assistance was certainly one of the most rewarding and enriching experiences I ever had. Thank you, Scottish Rite, for this great opportunity. The following article is from the Winter 2002 California Freemason Magazine, and this is the cover story. The Midnight Mission, a testament to the power of Masonic relief. Providing relief to a brother in distress has been an essential tenet of Masonry from the beginning. Although work in the craft was dangerous, a Mason knew that his brothers would provide aid if he was injured and that his widow and orphans also would receive assistance. Giving relief was also a concern of the lodges being established in the colonies. The oldest known record of American Masons setting aside money for the purpose of relief is found in the 1733 bylaws of the First Lodge in Boston. Monthly, every member shall pay at least two shillings more per quarter to be applied as charity towards the relief of poor brethren. Masonic relief in the United States has paralleled the evolving needs of American society. In a short talk bulletin, S. Brent Morris writes, quote, When food and shelter were immediate and almost daily concerns, Masons responded with firewood and the fruits of their harvests. When care of the aged, widows, and orphans were worries, Masons erected retirement homes and orphanages. When education was needed, Masons built schools. And when these basic needs moved even further from common experience, Masons turned their philanthropy to crippled children, burn victims, the speech and language impaired, cancer patients, and others. End quote. As relief for a brother or his family has become less necessary in modern society, Masons have put the teachings of relief into practice outside the fraternity. Relieving the suffering of those less fortunate today often means giving aid to those who appear to be hopeless. One of the most significant examples of such relief is the Midnight Mission, founded in 1914 by Brother Tom Lidicote, a lay preacher with 40 years of welfare work experience. The Midnight Mission has continuously served the needs of the homeless in the Skid Row district of Los Angeles for almost 90 years. The story of the Midnight Mission and how it has evolved to meet the changing needs of society's outcasts is more than an inspiring story. It's a testament to the enduring strength of the Masonic relief belief. Relief was a meal. Originally, the mission's purpose was to spiritually rescue Los Angeles' downtrodden. A meal was served at midnight following hours of religious sermons, thus the origin of its name. For the first few years, operating funds to provide the meals came from Lidicote. When he could no longer afford to keep the mission open by himself, Brother Lidicote established a governing board of five prominent Los Angeles Masons who continued to provide relief with funds from their own pockets. By 1929, an expanded board of directors, all of whom were Masons, realized that more than meals were necessary to provide relief in a meaningful way. The mission's focus shifted to helping men and boys rehabilitate themselves by restoring their self-respect, self-support, and self-confidence through a recovery program grounded in the 12-step principles. Religious services were no longer a requisite. The meal was changed to early evening, and shower facilities, barber services, clean clothes, and sleeping accommodations were added. A training program to develop marketable work skills also was established. Today, the mission is one of the largest and most efficiently operated institutions of its kind. Its focus is helping people break cycles of welfare dependency and self-destruction. A broad range of emergency and rehabilitation services are available for those who want to get off the streets and back into mainstream society. This charity would not exist without the efforts of brothers who are dedicated to the Masonic principle of relief, says Brother Larry Adamson, Midnight Mission President and Chief Administrative Officer. In the mission's history, all but seven of the 82 board members have been Masons, and starting with the founder, Masons have led the charity at the management level. The tenure of board service for many of the Masons signifies their commitment to making a difference. Ellsworth Meyer, past Grand Master, served 35 years. Myron Smith, past Grand Master, served 44 years. And Ralph Head, see memorial on page 9, attended 99% of the meetings during his 41 years on the board. Steve Doan, current board chairman and past Grand Master, has served 18 years. Relief Without Judgment The Midnight Mission's operating philosophy is unique among social service agencies for three reasons. First, an individual does not have to meet any qualifications or have a specific need that matches a service provided by the mission. If the mission does not provide a specific service, the individual will be connected to another resource rather than turned away. Second, the mission allows clients to stay as long as necessary, generally 12 to 18 months, to become self-sufficient. Government-funded programs typically have time limits of 30, 60, or 90 days, then the client may be on the street again. 
Third, the mission does not accept government funds. Individual donations make up 88% of the operating income. The remainder comes from corporate and charitable foundation contributions. Our operating policies and the way we deal with transient guests and program clients are based on Masonic principles, says Adamson. We extend relief in this community without judgment, without restrictions, and without government funds. Just who are the mission's clients and what are their needs? 30 years ago, the typical client was male, about 60 years old, suffering from alcoholism. The mission provided subsistence and a place of dignity to live out the remaining days of his life. Today's typical client is still male, but the average age has dropped to 35. Clients have more serious and difficult drug dependency issues. The average length of chemical dependency is 19 years, so the need is not just getting these clients sober, but helping them function as adults. The primary focus of the Midnight Mission today is rehabilitation, to bridge the gap where many of the clients have struggled with their ability to function in the mainstream society. Not all are addicted. For those who are, the biggest challenge isn't getting them off a substance. It's instilling techniques for coping in society and taking responsibility for themselves so they don't revert to destructive patterns. Lives are given purpose. The mission runs on the talents of those seeking help. Residents are offered jobs at the facility four to six weeks after entering the program. In addition, everyone has work duties and must perform community service hours, such as cleaning up the streets in the immediate area. The Masonic belief of taking responsibility for oneself and seeking self-improvement is at work here, says Steve Doan. We want the mission to stay on the cutting edge of helping men and women rehabilitate themselves. While the clients are primarily male, one changing dynamic is the number of women seeking protection and assistance. A major challenge today is addressing the needs of a large number of abused and abandoned women with children who are unschooled, unclothed, and unfed, says Larry Adamson. Fifteen years ago, 10% of our clients were women and children. Today, it's about 20% and growing. And just a reminder, this is written 20 years ago. To adapt to this growing need, the Midnight Mission established the Family Housing Complex in Inglewood, California, which provides safe transitional housing, counseling, and financial management and life skills development so the family can leave the program with a substantial savings account. It's Masonic philosophy in action, touching one person at a time, says Dr. Ron Koritz, Master Mason and Midnight Mission board member. The approach is to offer more than just food. We provide both a fish and a fishing rod. When he asked what he feels is his greatest accomplishment at the mission, Adamson gives a very modest Masonic response. Every day a man comes up to thank me, saying he's going back to his life. A Legacy of Masonic Management Tom Littlecoat, founder of the Midnight Mission, was a lay preacher known in the community as Father of the Poor and Bishop of the Underworld. He headed the mission from 1914 until 1933. When Brother Harry Richmond was named the director in 1933, the Midnight Mission was the only Los Angeles agency that could meet the emergency food and housing needs when the Depression hit. It served 9,000 meals daily and housed an average of 2,300 men each night. Richmond oversaw the rehabilitation programs for 38 years until his death in 1971, right after the Northridge earthquake destroyed the mission's building. Clancy Immisland, the mission's third leader, was not a Mason when hired in 1971. I was so impressed with the men on the board, says Brother Immisland, I soon asked how I could become a Mason. For 25 years, Immisland compassionately expanded the mission's programs. With extensive experience in the field of alcohol recovery, he incorporated the 12-step recovery process into the rehabilitation program. Four years ago, when he turned 70, Immisland decided to put his marketing background to work in the new position of managing director for fundraising and public relations. Following a 22-year career in management with the Automobile Club of Southern California, Brother Larry Adamson became the mission's first president in 1998. He had served on the board of directors since 1993. Adamson will guide the Midnight Mission as it significantly increases program capacity and expands services to meet still-evolving needs. One touch of nature made the whole world kin. It began as a typical day for Grand Master Motley Hughes Flint. He awoke at the usual hour, ate breakfast, and prepared to leave for his job as postmaster for the city of Los Angeles. Then his telephone rang, and Flint would soon find himself immersed in the most critical relief effort of his life. It was April 18, 1906, and the city of San Francisco had just been devastated by what would be known as the Great Earthquake and Fire. The next morning, Flint and Grand Orator Oscar Lawler arrived in Oakland on the first train north from Los Angeles. I believed it was my duty to go to San Francisco at once, Flint said. We found the streets crowded with panic-stricken people from San Francisco, practically all of whom had lost their earthly possessions. 
Almost immediately, Flint and Lawler were at an emergency meeting at the Masonic Temple in Oakland. The magnificent Masonic Temple on Montgomery and Post Streets in San Francisco had by then been evacuated. The 52nd Annual Convocation of the Grand Chapter of the Royal Arch was meeting there, but the meeting was abandoned the second day of its session. It would be the last Masonic meeting held in this edifice, which was left in ruins after the fire. With all area banks and most telegraph offices closed, the most immediate problem was to secure cash to fund a relief effort. Postal money orders transferred between Los Angeles and Oakland were the only accessible funds. Grandmaster Flint immediately transferred $3,000 in money orders from his personal accounts. The funds were used to feed the hungry and shelter the homeless. Certainly one of the saddest sights I have ever seen was during the first days of our relief work in San Francisco, Flint remembered. Mothers called us as we drove through the streets, begging for bread for their children and milk for their babies. Flint also recalled the story of an older brother and his wife who wanted to be sent to Cleveland. The gentleman was a member of the Masonic bodies in Chicago and was destitute. Further, he was paralyzed from the waist down. I finally secured a good Masonic brother who was strong and rugged and who carried on his shoulders this paralyzed and destitute brother several miles to the ferry and started them safely for Cleveland. A pre-planned cornerstone ceremony on April 21st instead turned out to be the opening of a new food station at King Solomon's Temple near Golden Gate Commandery. Flint recalled, The next morning in King Solomon's Temple, Grand Order Lawler and I spent many hours, he cutting slices of bread and I opening cans of corned beef, preparing sandwiches to feed the hundreds of people surrounding the temple. During the five months following the disaster, Flint received 179 telegrams and sent 115. He received 992 letters and sent 1123. In his words, I little thought when I assumed the position of Grand Master that such a responsibility would be forced upon my shoulders. Flint continued to praise the hard work of the local lodge leadership as well as the generosity of jurisdictions nationally and worldwide. By September 1st, more than $315,000 had been raised to provide relief following the April disaster. Funds had been sent from all over the country, including the Grand Lodge of New York, which provided the largest amount of $41,407, and Pennsylvania, which sent $20,933. Gifts of cash also arrived from Canada, South Australia, Mexico, and Ireland. The hardest work, however, was performed at the site of the disaster, where hundreds of Masons worked for weeks providing relief for Masons and non-Masons alike. One of the most compelling descriptions of these efforts was that of Harry L. Lask, Secretary of the San Francisco Board of Relief. He wrote in his 1906 report at the annual communication, One touch of nature made the whole world kin. As disastrous and sorrowful was calamity, it had its good effect of making all of us as one family and binding the tie of brotherly love and fraternity stronger. It knew no station in life. All, like the teachings of Freemasonry, were of inequality. They met upon the level and parted upon the square. And then there's a little side note here. Grandmaster Motley Hughes Flint, Grandmaster 1905-1906. Motley Hughes Flint was born in Somerville, Massachusetts in 1863. His family moved to San Francisco when he was a boy, where he received a limited education in the public schools. Instead of pursuing a higher education, he decided to begin a business career early and moved to Los Angeles when he was 21. Flint soon joined Eastgate Lodge No. 3. He became master in 1898 at the age of 33, three years after his older brother. His brother was a well-known lawyer, Frank Putnam Flint, who went on to become a state senator and leader of the California Republican Party. Motley Hughes Flint was named Postmaster of Los Angeles in 1904, a position he held for six years before continuing his career in the banking industry. In addition to being Grand Master in 1906, his Masonic career included 25 years as Chairman of the Board of Relief in Los Angeles, as well as positions on the Board of the Masonic Homes of California and the Endowment Committee. Withstanding the Ravages of Force Relief efforts salvage historic Masonic documents as flood devastates the Czech Republic. Flood stormed through the Czech Republic in August, causing 2.9 million in damages, displacing thousands of people and washing away a great deal of history on its rampage. The Grand Lodge of the Czech Republic is one of the institutions that suffered extensive losses. Located in Leiben, a district of Prague, the Grand Lodge stood along the river. When flooding commenced on the night of August 13th, it received the full brunt of the deluge, with water reaching the ceiling almost immediately and staying that high for nearly a week. The lodge offices and library were in the basement of the building. The flood caused complete immersion of more than 2,500 books of the Grand Lodge library, a significant number of which dated back to the 18th and 19th centuries. 
what had been patiently saved by generations of Masons from the devastations of time and war, and which had been successfully been hidden away from the plundering of the Nazis and communists, was engulfed and reduced to nothingness in just a few moments during the night, says Jock Hugobert, Deputy Grandmaster. When the waters had at last receded, members and volunteers entered the lodge and organized the transportation of what they believed warranted saving. They focused on salvaging Masonic archives, documents, and books, all of which were floating around in a smelly mass of muddy water. About 90% of the items were removed, then washed with clear water to remove mud, individually packed in plastic foil, transported to a cold storage facility, and kept at a temperature of negative 4 degrees Fahrenheit. Since the flood, support has been forthcoming. Approximately $10,000 was donated from a number of Grand Lodges in the United States, as well as a combined $4,000 donated from Freemasons in France, Belgium, Holland, and Germany. The Grand Lodge of California alone contributed $5,000. We intend to use the funds for the restoration of the 2500 book library, which is currently deep frozen in a cold storage room owned by one of the brothers, says Hugo Bear. Masonry in the Czech Republic dates back to 1741. It has endured political suppression during the Austrian Empire, as well as communist pressure in 1948 that led to the dissolution of Czech Masons in 1952. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, Masonry regained recognition from the government. In 1990, the Czechoslovak Grand Lodge was revived by 28 of the surviving pre-1948 members. According to Hugo Bear, the tragic flood has reinforced fraternity between Czech Masons and has forced them to refocus on the core values of Masonry. Hugo Bear reflects that time, nature, and political events have periodically destroyed the material objects that are believed so important. He says this is the time to remember our ritual, which teaches us that Freemasonry, notwithstanding, has still survived. Thank you for listening. If you like what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a comment. We enjoy hearing from our listeners. If you really like what you heard, share this podcast with your friends and lodge members. Visit us online at solomonstaircase.org.